Hey, everybody. Welcome tonight to Chat. Once again, here we are. It's me, Mike Lopez from Chat. Um, it's just me solo tonight. No Grazia tonight, but I hope everybody enjoyed his uh, show, Get In Tune, last night. Um, tonight on our Chat, we are very, very excited because we have an awesome, incredible guest star. Um, hey, and we're going to bring him on live. Oh, let me turn my sound off of my device here. But we're going to bring him on right now. Um, you guys know him from, gosh, so many things, and things are falling like my water here. You know him from so many different things, Return of the Jedi, um, the Muppets, and like my personal favorite we were just talking about, he, he flipped off Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock in Star Trek IV. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to Incredit Chat tonight, the one and only Kirk Thatcher. Oh, hello. Hey. Hello. Hi, Mike, how are you? I am doing great. Looks like you're playing some music over there today. I'm playing the ukulele and my uh, screen rang. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, we did not mean to interrupt. You were playing for Kermit. Oh, you know what? I was just practicing. I wasn't writing anything <laughs> important. So welcome welcome to Incredit Chat tonight, Kirk. Thank you very much. I mean, you, you, I mean, it's great to have you. You have worked on some of the most, with, with some of the most iconic properties of our time. Yes. Yeah. It pays, um, to, it pays to bribe people, I've learned. <laughs> and, I mean, m most definitely, I mean, we should probably start off as, like, how did you get started in this? Well, I was, uh, you know, I said I didn't date. I made movies. Uh, when I was a kid, I spent my weekends and my free time and my, you know, allowance money, uh, Super 8 films, making model kits, making little movies, uh, drawing, painting, just... I was very motivated as a creator and artist. And uh, what I liked about movies was, and, and making movies was you could kind of do everything. You could write, you could act if you want, you do makeup, you could make miniatures and things. So I was a, an autodidact is the fancy term for self-taught kind of filmmaker uh, on the artistic creatures, uh, model kits and all that. And um, so that was sort of my own passion. And then, when I was about 14 or 15, I think I just turned 15, Star Wars came out. Mm. And my and I knew about it before it came out because I was reading magazines called uh, Cine Fantastique back then, which would talk about science fiction and fantasy movies that were coming out. And uh, so I was there first day, well, Grandma's Chinese were screening. And I knew I'd wanted to make movies, but that sealed the deal. I was like, that's what I wanted. That's the kind of movies I want to be involved with. And then, uh, as fortune would have it, I met Joe Johnston, who was the production designer at ILM. And he storyboarded the movie, designed a lot of the uh, spaceships with Grant McCune, mm -hmm. who's part of the, the main art director production designer for, for ILM. And I met him. Uh, his Both our mothers went to the same church. So <laughs> I uh, he gave me a tour of ILM, and I said, I want to work here someday and I was again 15 and I you know I showed him my artwork and he said this is good do more of this you know you're on the right path and uh so that's and then you know I, I would do special effects for my own movies and and uh mm -hmm. for stage plays at high school I did makeups and made a dummy stuff like that and then uh, after I graduated high school I went up with some buddies that summer and we toured ILM which had moved to uh uh, Marin County up north of San Francisco, where I grew up about a mile and a half from the original ILM in Van Nuys. Gotcha. So that's why it was so easy to meet Joe and, and get a tour there. So we toured it again, and I left a creature behind that I'd made and and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm starting UCLA in the fall, but uh, I would love to, you know, I'd drop everything and come work here. And uh, about six months later, I got a I called Joe because they had announced they were starting on, um, this is Joe Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, started working on, on Return of the Jedi, which didn't even have a title at that point, but I knew they were working on it. And I said, hey, I'll come up and make coffee, you know, and run the Xerox machine. I don't care. I, I just want to be a part of it because I learned that at UCLA, you couldn't even touch a camera until you were a, a junior. And two more years of, of, you know, just film theory seemed like uh, for, forever. So what was funny was he just put my name on a list for people to interview because George wanted a creature shop uh, in Marin, not just in London, where it was still going to be shot. So <clears throat> he put me on a list to uh, interview. I drove up with some creatures and drawings and interviewed with Phil Tippett. Wow. <clears throat> Actually, sorry, with Chris Wallace and Ken Ralston and uh, interviewed with uh, Tom um, <clears throat> Smith, who was running it. And about two weeks later, they called and they said, we would like to hire you. And I packed up a car and my parents kissed me goodbye and I rented an apartment and 
<laughs> moved to Warren County and started working. Wow. What was it like coming in? Um, so like you said, you were there for the premiere of the episode, as we call it, episode four now. But the, the oh, original yeah. New Hope, yeah. Star Wars. Well, so, I mean, so you there was a buzz. Like, it was, there was a line outside around the building. People had heard about it. There had been a couple premiere screenings in Hollywood, so families and stuff. But there, and there was definitely a buzz in the science fiction community. I'd gone to a couple conventions even before sci fi conventions in my, like, at 14. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, so there was an excited kind of air about this movie and what it was about. And then after that Star Destroyer is chasing the rebel blockade runner, everyone just, and my mom was, I mean, I was 14, I was 15. So my mom drove, you know, went with us and uh, she was kind of blown away. And, and as we all were, and that ship came over, I was everyone just erupted like, wow. And then at the end of the movie, everyone stayed and applauded the, you know, 10 minute trail or uh, uh, credits. Mm -hmm. And some people were standing and my mom, we, you know, she grew up in LA and went, had gone to movie, never worked in the business, but gone to movies her whole life. And she said, I'd never seen a movie get a reception like that. Yeah. So it was amazing. And, and uh, you know, I, I think I went back, well, I know I went back and saw it 10 times. It's oh. the only movie I, I saw 10 times. I used to be able to recite it kind of, you know, this is before VHS tapes or anything. You just saw it so much that you would hold it in your brain. And friends and I would sit around in high school and recite the entire movie to each other. <laughs> You know, it's funny, like you mentioned that. and we'll get to Muppets in a minute, but I used to be that way with the great Muppet caper. That was, <laughs> that was my favorite Muppet movie. But, That's a good um, movie. Yeah. Um, so you so you, you saw it, you saw it 10 times in the theaters. You were there for this big premiere. Um, then what was it like? All of a sudden, here you were working on it. But we're working yeah. on the third installment. Three, three years later, three, three and a half years later, I'm working on it. Um, I was just giddy i mean people say what was it like it's like well you just kind of wake up and and I, you know literally i would do anything my first job was one of my first jobs was cleaning the exploded head bits from uh, raiders of the lost ark <laughs> off the walls and ceiling in in the uh, one of the filming bays and then uh they set up this new creature shop in an adjoining building so my my first job at the actual creature shop was to paint it and it had like 24 foot ceilings it was a big industrial building mm -hmm. So I was on a scissor lift with an airless sprayer painting it um, and then just started in setting it up. I was literally there ground zero helping to set it up even before Phil Tippett moved in. And Phil was uh, finishing up Dragon Slayer at the time. So they were finishing up Raiders and Dragon Slayer while I started setting up the um, the actual facility or the creature shop. So it was great. I mean, I, I don't know. I just, you know, you know, what they say, pinch yourself every morning. I, I was just... <laughs> I, 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 in some ways, when you're that young, you don't realize how lucky you are. Mm -hmm. I knew I was lucky, but I also kind of had been so driven, you know, since the time I was 10 or 12. So for me, well, of course I'm working on this. I've been wanting to work on this at least, you know, for three, four years. And I've been wanting to do this kind of work for the last 10 years. Uh, so, again, you, you're <laughs> – I look back now as as – people have asked me and it's like, oh my gosh, what was it like? It's like, I was the thing I was doing. I was happy. You know? <laughs> I was a happy kid and I was a happy camper. I just, I was giddy. I mean, I was ridiculously silly. You can ask Phil Tippett about it. I was just, <laughs> just a goofball because I was so darn happy to be there and, and had a blast and learned so much and, and was appreciated, which was great as being a 19 year old kid. Mm -hmm. but because I was self-taught, I knew how to mix paint. I had a good eye for color. Gotcha. I'd been taught oil painting uh, at, at uh, my dad's secretary because I had no artists in my family. So nobody really knew about movie making or even though my parents had both grown up in L.A., yeah. they, they only knew like an actor. And my grandmother, my step-grandmother, uh, was a, had been a screenwriter, but like 30 years earlier. So there was no real connection. So even in art classes, I... Uh, the school I went to didn't really offer oil painting or anything beyond, you know, some simple stuff. So my dad's secretary was a still life painter who taught nice little old ladies how to paint, you know, fruit bowls and things and fl flowers and seascapes. And so I was going to her class and I was painting Frankenstein and Dracula and skulls with eyeballs. And, and they all were so sweet about it. But so I had some training in art, color theory and mixing yeah. color. So I set up the paint shop. I knew how to make molds, and, and I learned how to make better molds there. So it was amazing. It was, I got to work on Star Wars and get a training in filmmaking. It, it really was, you know, I joked, but it absolutely, if I'd had the wherewithal to, to pay them, I would have paid them, you know, 40 bucks a day or something to, oh, okay. to work on, just because I knew it was such a great experience. 
Well, I mean, sir, and certainly at that time in Hollywood, like you, you know, you said you had your your step grandmother was a screenwriter. Yeah. And I, I mean, the movies that she was working on, by far, once Star Wars came out, came out, that changed the game of how the Hollywood blockbuster. Yeah, and she did dramas very seriously. She'd been a journalist, so she wrote a movie about. I think it was caged heat. It was about women in pr women's prisons, and she, as a journalist, had been disguised as a prisoner and, and spent like a month in in a woman's prison to write this article, and then decided that would be a great story for a movie, gotcha. and then wrote a, a a screenplay. And but I didn't know any of this growing up. I only found out later when my mom told me. Well, I knew she been a writer but that wasn't interesting to me and i didn't really know and she wasn't working when i knew her she was a nice old lady who smoked cigarettes and collected art <laughs> um, so but she was very urbane she her name was virginia kellogg and uh she reminded me of um oh there was a woman i think her name was virginia too who who uh did uh commercials for like coffee but she talked like this my grandmother had a smoker's voice very like you know throaty and like Oh, darling, you please. And she was very urbane and, and sophisticated. And I remember when my brother and I would go there, like, don't touch anything, sit on your hands. So, but, but again, no, no input. My mom told me later after my grandmother had passed away that she had told my mom, whatever you can do, talk him out of working in entertainment in the film business. Um, before I'd gotten the Lucasfilm job, um, she goes, it's, it's a terrible industry. He's very creative and that's great, but it's a horrible business. Um, you know, uh, and she'd been married to a producer before my yeah. grandma, my grandfather. And so she knew it well. Um, and my mom had not told me anything because, you know, I hadn't even graduated high school at that point. But when I got the job at Lucasfilm, my mom consulted with my grandmother and she said, well, if he's working there at 19, you know, then he obviously has the passion and the skills to, to, you know, uh, make a, make a go of it. Um, but my mom didn't. My mom was sweet enough to not tell me that until I had a pretty solid career for about ten years. <laughs> well, I mean, and like as you as you said, like, I mean, what I mean, what better place to uh, start than film school? Well, I got paid. I, I jokingly say I got paid to go to film school because not only did I work in the creature shop, yeah. I was on location for about five months in Yuma, Arizona, and uh, five months altogether, about half and half. I think we're there in the forest the green moon of Endor, which was Southern Oregon for about six weeks. And I think uh, five weeks or so in, uh, in uh, Yuma, Arizona. So I watched a film being made and I, me being garrulous and friendly, I was friends with the producer, Robert Watts, the camera. I just talked to everybody. Mm -hmm. The one thing you learn, particularly back then, there wasn't this, you know, industry of cranking out film school students, you know, you, you, it was kind of a catch all of different characters. And everybody liked to tell their story. So I'm like, how, you know, what do you do as the producer? And, you know, at lunch, I wouldn't bother them. I was smart enough to not bother them when they're working. But there's a lot of downtime if you've ever been on a movie set. Particularly one of that scale. Well, you get like six, eight shots off in a day. It's a good day. I mean, because we were on this in Yuma and in Oregon, you know, all these huge set pieces and explosions. And um, so it, it was great. And I learned, yeah, I learned epic filmmaking uh, at, at a very young age. So it was fantastic. And I mean, certainly, and I'm just go, going over some of the other things that you've worked on, like you yep. kind of definitely got an eye for some of the creatures, like you worked on Gremlins, you worked on House, things yeah. like that. Like how, I guess that, start, I mean, having- well, start, Yeah, starting on Jedi was a good <laughs> resume piece. And then I knew Chris Wayless because he had actually hired me. He was the guy that said, well, hire this guy. And then he left ILM uh, pretty much like, I think the week I started, the week before I started to start his own company. Yeah. Um, and so when Jedi was finished and I'd worked a little bit on ET and Poltergeist, Chris, uh, I was working with him on stuff on the weekends, little jobs, and he got gremlins and he hired me to set up the paint shop and mold shop for mm. gremlins. And uh, I painted, I designed their paint jobs and I set up their paint scheme. And then I designed their eyeballs and how their eyes were painted and uh, worked on gremlins for about nine months. And wow. then, and then started a rock video production company with David Fincher as his as his production designer. So then we did rock videos for a year, and then I went back to UCLA. Uh, so I was on Gremlins for the build, and then I was on set puppeteering for a couple of weeks. And anyway, did rock videos with Dave Fincher for about nine months to a year, then moved back to LA to learn computer graphics because I knew that was going to take over the effects business, uh, just seeing what mm -hmm. they were 
at, at what was was then what is now Pixar was them just Lucasfilm's computer graphics unit. Mm -hmm. And at UCLA for a semester, uh, I met. Uh, I was in, uh, uh, they interviewed me for uh, Star Trek Four to work with Leonard Nimoy. Well, because that's why I was that's why, that's why I was going to go. So now you yeah. left one huge science fiction um franchise yeah, yeah. go yeah. right into the i mean essentially their competitor at the time i know i said i worked on both stars star wars star trek <laughs> yeah I, it's a nice portfolio piece all before i was 25 i mean it's kind of amazing i mean i look back at my career i go who the hell did you know you know and it wasn't nepotism i just was <laughs> i had enough skill and enough uh you know i credit my mother with teaching me how to be a decent person and, you know, and she would say things like, well, to have a friend, you've got to be a friend. So mm -hmm. I just learned, you know, be nice to people and 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 don't tell them all about you. Listen about them. That's how you learn. And, and people like to talk about themselves. So my mother kind of, you know, turned me from a feral, a feral child into a, a decent person. Um, and I give her lots of credit for that. But it, it helped. You know, it's a social skill and you don't need it. I mean, there's definitely I mean, there's notorious directors and producers who are complete screaming psychopaths who've done very well in the business but yeah. i probably don't have enough enough drive to uh <laughs> i did it by with kindness instead of uh well i don't know if it's kindness but just being a nice person um but yeah and then went right into us well i'm dropping a couple of things like i storyboarded almost an entire movie called cat's eye oh that's a drew barrymore correct yeah in fact the, the homage they made because i storyboarded the movie was they named her character Thatcher. If you watch Cat's Eye, the Drew Barrymore segment, they show a, a close-up of the mailbox of the house and it says the Thatchers. Nice. That was that was my little cameo, right. a name cameo. Um, so yeah, uh, and then yeah, I, I met Leonard. They were looking, Leonard was looking for an assistant who knew special effects because on Star Trek Three, which I did some work on, I worked on two and three. In fact, I was on set of Star Trek three for about two weeks off and on but i was in la uh the main thing i did was puppeteered the um klingon dog kind okay. of like a sm scr scroungy lizard dog i was under krug's seat puppeteering him and then there's a in fact there's a picture of me in cinefex in a tyvek suit covered in slime puppeteering the um we just called them the bacteria worms that uh came out of spock's coffin that uh, krug they chose that up yeah yeah so uh, I had worked with Leonard on set. He didn't know me, and I never really interfaced with him. I mean, he might go, "I have the dog look left and right," you know, while I'm under a, I'm under a chair with headphones on. Um, but anyway, so he was looking, interviewing for an assistant, and I fit the bill. I just left ILM within the year, knew everybody there, knew effects, had a production design, art direction background. The things that he felt he didn't, he was he was an actor, and he knew scripts and story yeah. and acting. He knew camera, but he didn't really know special effects and art direction. That was not, you know, things that he had, that he felt that he was strong in and he wanted an ally. So I fit the bill perfectly and we hit it off. I mean, he, I said he became like a, a favorite uncle and uh, it was great to work with him. I, I had a blast. We had a lot of laughs. He's very, um, jovial is not the right word, but he has a great sense of humor. He, you know, a low fuse. He wasn't a screamer. He, he, I saw him got angry. He got angry once in a meeting and I, after, because he wasn't getting what he wanted. Um, mm. And he pounded the table and like was, and people just mm. shut like the room. You could literally hear a, a pin drop. Mm. And uh, afterwards I was like, are you, are you okay? And you're like, well, I've never seen you that mad. And he goes, ah, it's been acting. <laughs> he knew how to act really angry to get the point across. Yeah. Because he was frustrated, but you know, just to see somebody who was pretty calm all the time suddenly just go, "Damn it!" You know, like, oh, and just you're like, "Whoa!" Um, and then to find out that it was basically him acting more angry than he really was, but to get people to listen. Uh, so it was great, and I, again, then I got to see how a movie was made from the second draft of the script, mm -hmm. you know, but from the director's perspective, not from a crew member you know, kind of standing around watching. I was there listening to all the decisions on the script, camera, I mean, everything, wardrobe. Uh, and I helped, that's where I helped a lot. I would, you know, I helped with all the alien designs for the, what do we call it, the Alien UN, the Federation Council. Gotcha. I had a, two buddies of mine, a buddy of mine designed most of them and my rich friend, Richard, I got him the job baking the aliens and he made Spock's ears for that movie and mm -hmm. watched his career in the, in the business. Um, and became really good friends with Ralph Winter, who was the basically the product, the, 
the producer who was the the money guy you know harv bennett was a creative producer yeah. and ralph was more the financial you know making sure everybody gets paid and you don't go over budget mm -hmm. and uh, and brooke breton who was the other so we brooke and i became the associate producers we were like the junior team mm -hmm. um, she, she and i are about the same age she might be a little younger but uh or i think we're actually the same age uh and she had come from production and i'd come from well production but more on the you know creature side and making things she'd come more for producing things so we were a good team uh ralph brooke and i was kind of leonard's right hand guy she was ralph's right hand gal and we became the associate producers and it was a, it just a, one of the best experiences in my life on a movie yeah i mean i definitely have to say in regards to that particular i'm and i'm a i'm a star wars fan i'm a star trek fan yeah, me too. Uh, there, there's um thing about that movie in particular um, and just the relationships. Um, and I, mean, I don't know if you can speak to it. Just the relationships yeah. that the core group of characters had in that movie. It was it was different than anything they had ever done on the TV show. It was different. I mean, certainly different than that first movie, and that then different than the movies before it. Like, that all came from Leonard. He, I remember, he said, "I want to focus on the characters." He goes, I, I, "I've done the plot-driven movie with a bad guy and." And you know, the planet blowing up and all that. He said, "I want to do a movie that focuses on their characters, their relationships, because that's what made the show successful." And he's an actor, and that's what, as an actor, you focus on. Which I learned working with him, and even working with all the the Muppeteer, the puppeteers uh, at the Muppets. They focus on the character, and then you know, transmit it through their hands. But that's why people vibe with these uh, projects and these characters across, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, Muppets. The, the performers and the writers imbue them with a reality and, a, and a, a sensibility, even though science fiction and fantasy typically are about what if, you know, what's a crazy idea, what's a crazy world, but what you associate with and what you react to and, and sort of uh, relate to are the characters. So Leonard said, I want to do a movie that focuses on that. And I want to um, have it be about something we're doing now that screws us later. Mm -hmm. And they have to do this time travel thing. And so Mearson and Crickus had written the first draft, and it was more of a caper. And they were going to have Eddie Murphy was big at Paramount. He had a deal with Paramount, and they wanted Eddie Murphy to play essentially the character that um, became the uh, the marine biologist. Yeah. Uh, but it was more of a caper about getting all these bits and pieces back. You know, we needed like they were needed Evian water and some sort of nuclear thing, and it was. It was very caper. It was more of a comedy in that way. And Leonard just, it didn't work for him. Not that it was a bad script. They were good screenwriters. He just wanted to be about our characters, not about this you know, Eddie Murphy character. Because it would become an Eddie Murphy movie then in Star Trek. Exactly. It would be an Eddie Murphy movie star, you know, featuring the Star Trek crew. So he he made the Jillian character. And 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 the big, the big get, the big difference was whales. Like, they came back and realized that all this bad stuff was happening because whales had been become extinct. Yeah, um, which was this great message and very, very as you said, it was it was a very Star Trek premise that had never been done before. Mm -hmm. You know, focusing on the characters and a science fiction concept of making something go extinct that actually might screw the planet later. You know, the obvious things is you know pollution and, and climate change, but this was a species. So um, they ran with that and they brought Nick Myers in to write all the stuff in the uh, present day 1985 at that point mm -hmm. 86 and harv bennett wrote the the bookends and uh so again i mean i was involved from those early drafts and leonard's meeting but the, the to your point that all came from leonard and and obviously harv and nick let's make this about our crew how they relate to each other how they relate to spock spock was dead and brought back mm -hmm. by you know kind of magic and with science and, and you know the scene with bones is like what was it like? And he's like, well, uh, you know, without a common frame of reference. And he's like, you mean I have to die? To, yeah, was, <laughs> you know, it was such a great Kirk, I mean, sorry, Spock Bones moment. And yeah. there's a lot of great moments in that movie, you know, and it's, funny bits. It's hard. That, of all, I mean, and listen, I love, I love all, even Star Trek, the motion picture, I still like. And Star Trek <laughs> Five. But, you know, and, but I think for at least those last three movies, Star Trek Four kind of, like you said, set the relationships, there was heart there. Like, I mean, we certainly saw that Bones, Kirk and Spock relationship in Star Trek V and into and then yeah. into Star Trek uh, VI as well. But I mean, there's just something about that. And then, you know, yeah, the, from yeah and the, the, I mean, the, the, I think there were just some great comedic, the, 
uh, check off on on the nuclear with the nuclear vessels and, and you know and uh, you know McCoy and um, Scotty with the the guy in Hello Computer. You know? yeah. like, that was oh. my joke. I actually wrote that gag. So originally he was just going to give him the computer and he was going to type on it. And I said, first of all, they would talk to the computer. Because yeah. I was a Star Trek fan. I said, shouldn't he like? Wouldn't it be funny if he he talked? And I mean, look, what's crazy is they were listening to me because I mean I was. Leonard had the 800 pound gorilla, but I was his right hand guy. So I'd make, they made me feel, at least Leonard made me feel comfortable enough to make suggestions. And then they went through with them. Um, so I said, shouldn't he try and talk to it? And they're like, yeah, that's funny. He said, well, you should grab the mouse because I would use the Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my computer. The computer they used was the same one I had. It wasn't my actual one, but the same one I had. I said, when he says use the mouse, he should pick it up like a microphone. <laughs> so they, they ran with it. So I got those two gags in there and, uh, Another thing I got to do, which I only really tweeted about this last year even, was the, the questions at the beginning of the movie where Spock is in the, uh, at the computer in Vulcan and going, who said logic is the man of civilization, and you know, all those questions. Yeah. I wrote them. Leonard and Hard Bennett said, I need a bunch of uh, technical questions that sound 23rd century and about everything, philosophy and art and science. And, and if you just want to, write those up. And I said, sure, I love that stuff. And I, you know, I was a science nerd and a sci-fi nerd. So I wrote up a bunch of questions and Leonard said, hey, do you just wanna, we need a recording for me to react to so I can respond to these questions. Do you wanna just record it? I said, sure. So I just, you know, they they had me speak into a mic somewhere. I don't even remember where we did it, but it was not, you know, fancy, but it was like, who said logic is the man of our civilization, which was in chaos using your reason, our guide. And then they sped it up even more. and kind of gave it that and that's what he spoke to in the scene mm -hmm. and then later because we all just thought it was a scratch track is what you call it it's just there mm -hmm. so he has to connect with something and then we'll fix it later and, and put in a fancy robot voice or something um but then leonard just said no nah, let's just use it and i like it they, they tweaked it a little more and made it a little more robotic and raised the pitch so i not only wrote those questions but that's my voice oh, wow. and when the movie was done ralph winters came to me and said look we're not going to give you credit for that. You're getting your SAG card from the song, I Hate You. That I wrote. He said, we're not going to give you credit for that. I mean, not writing credit, but I mean, even voice credit. He said, because your name would be in the credits four times. <laughs> so, that's okay. I don't need, I, I'm, I'm fine. So I well, waited, what is it, 30 years now I'm telling people that was me. So. Well, you know, that's that's, that's an excellent segue because, again, as we're sitting here talking, and we're, we're, I see a bunch of people are saying hi. I'll just quickly say um, uh, Heidi, Heidi App says, woohoo, Omar Jones says, Kirk, you, you're a true master. Carol mm -hmm. Robertson says, so cool, very interesting, fantastic. Uh, do you know DJ Bob? Yes, very good friend. What do you think of that weirdo DJ Bob, strange He's talk. one of the nicest weirdos I know, but the He's weird thing about him is he lives in Ron Kong 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 Kong. He lives in some weird planet named Ron Kong I can't even say it. <laughs> yeah, he's that was an inside joke, by the way. No, he's not. I, I, Ron Kong Kong He's down in the Ron Kong Kong About three hours, about three hours for me. Um, so you're talking about um, your song, I Hate You. So, yeah. so another element that really Star Trek for kind of, that was really the first time we really saw it in a Star Trek movie, as Spock and Kirk um, color, uh, put it, colorful metaphors. And you were one of the one of the people behind some of those you colorful metaphors. Shut down the noise when you stop that damn noise. Yeah. <laughs> and that was another story. Like there was a punk, that was a gag in, in Nick Meyer's script because punks were very prevalent at the time. And uh, so I just said to Leonard, because I'd been in a band and I'd had a punk, I'd had a mohawk, a much shorter one. Mm -hmm. and I might had orange hair. And I said, hey, I, I want to, I'd like to play the punk. And Leonard's like, really? I said, yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I did a drawing actually of what I still have. And I found it, a colored pencil drawing of me, what I would dress like. And, you know, I said, I'll do it like this. And he looked at it and he said, all right, well, let me think about it. And I'm like, okay. And I didn't bother him for a week, even though it was kind of every day. I'm like, is he going to say something? About a week later, he, I've told the story a million times, but at the end of the day, I'm leaving his office and he goes, all right, it was like, literally like a week later. He said, oh, by the way, uh, you can do it. And I was like, wait, wait, you mean the punk? He's like, yeah, <laughs> don't embarrass me, something like that. And then, so I got together the outfit and shaved my sides of my head, dyed my hair orange. Um, and then we did the scene, but there's no music. The music wasn't written, and I didn't know I was going to write the music. Yeah. So I said, 
I was just holding his boom box, just kind of going, da -na -na -na, just like in my head, just rocking out to nothing um, <laughs> for sound reasons. And so after the movie was edited, they wanted a punk song, you know? And so the Paramount Music guys came to Leonard and, and me, because I was kind of always his right-hand guy and said, oh, we've got, you know, Duran Duran or, I don't know, like, you know, the Boomtown Rat, something that wasn't really punk. I'm like, no, Leonard, that's, that's not punk. It should be like the Sex Pistols or, you know, True yeah. Sons of Liberty or Fear. And the music guy was like, oh, no, we're not going to deal with We're not going to make a deal with those guys. And so I turned to Leonard and said, hey, I wrote songs. I was in a band. I can do punk music. It should be really raw and angry. And he's like, again, just the amount of trust that he gave me was like, all right, well, uh, you know, uh, sure take a shot <laughs> so I, I wrote the song in about 20 minutes and it really was um about how i felt as growing up in the 70s the 60s and 70s with the threat of nuclear war mm -hmm. you know of all the fathers being dumped on us the sons and also in a tongue-in-cheek way like i i eschew you <laughs> i say screw you it was pretty erudite for a punk but punk <laughs> had a very tongue-in-cheek the ramones uh the dickies the toy dolls a lot of these bands were very sarcastic and funny in kind of a, a, a cutting way a snarky way so i wanted to give it that edge as kind of a wink too to the audience you know it wasn't about killing babies or anything or you know it, it wasn't really dark um but it had an underlying feeling of being a, like a gen xer where you just grow up with this fear of being destroyed and so I said, the idea was, what if, if you boil down punk to its essence, what is it? It's like, well, it's, I hate you. <laughs> like, whatever it is, for whatever reason, I hate you. So that was the song. We recorded it at the sound um, editing facility, Mark Mangini, uh, who was a friend of mine from Gremlins, and he was doing the movie. Uh, and so we became even better friends. And, and I wrote the lyrics, and I said, it kind of goes like this. And he turned it into like a four guitar, a four chord guitar riff. And one of the other sound designers played the drums uh, and another guy played the bass and we recorded it like, I think on a Saturday, mm -hmm. Leonard came in and we ran it for him with the clip. I think, mm -hmm. I know we played it for him on headphones. And so I'm standing there nervously and he's, he kind of standing there frowning, you know, he's like, oh, I'm like, Oh God, he hates it. And he, he takes off the headphones. He goes, it's awful or it's horrible. I'm like, <laughs> And he goes, oh, it's perfect. <laughs> it's supposed to be awful and loud and annoying. So I did it with that fake British accent, you know, screaming, essentially. So that's how it got in the movie. And then we made up the name of the band, Edge of Etiquette, came from, uh, came from, well, this is for Jason Vavona, who asked if I'm drinking any good bourbon. No, I'm doing <laughs> rum tonight. Rum tonight, Jason. Uh, it's sneaky night after this. That's my outfit. Um <laughs> But uh, where was I going with that? Oh, the song. Oh, Edge of Etiquette. Ralph Winter gave me that nickname because he said I would go to these meetings, sometimes for Leonard. Leonard couldn't make it. It was a production design meeting or an art department meeting. And I would go as sort of the king's representative, I said. And, and I would be me, which was kind of silly, a little edgy humor, but never combative or anything. And he would say, man, you get away with stuff. Like I would say stuff to the head of Paramount because I knew him as it was Sid Annis who worked <laughs> on Jedi. He was the head of publicity there. So I knew him. So I would make, I would crack jokes, you know, with him or to him, not about him <sighs> and get away with it. And Ralph goes, man, you just walk the edge of etiquette. You you are the edge of etiquette. And uh, so I said, well, they said, well, we'll just call it a Kirk Thatcher song. I'm like, no, no, let's, let's use this net band name, the edge of etiquette. So that's how that came about. Now, let me just ask, you know, uh, learning about your relationship with Leonard here, that, yeah. scene, that scene where he leaned over and uh, neck pinched you, that yeah. must have been probably hilarious because you already had a relationship with him. Well, yeah. And also I had this boom box and <laughs> the first time he did it, he doesn't pinch you at all. He just basically tapped me on the shoulder. So I was wearing this cheap leather jacket and I couldn't feel it. So and, you know, we're trying to time it. So right when he's doing the pinch, I'm looking away. That's why I was bopping like this, not just up and down. I was kind of being like, a, like I said, a sprinkler head. So there'd be a moment where I'm looking away and he can, you know, reach over and do it. And the first time he did it, I couldn't feel it. So I was like, <laughs> like trying to see, I could see that he was there, but was he pinching me? So, I, you know, we kind of laughed. And I said, if you could actually pinch down hard, that would 
work and I can feel it and react. He's like, and, you know, I was joke, probably made a joke about being a method actor, like really pinch me. <laughs> uh, and he said, well, in the movie, you know, in the series, you know, I just would touch people. I said, yeah, but I can't feel it through this jacket and all the leather gear. <laughs> so um, we did it a couple, I think we only shot that bit like three times going and back in the day, I mean, we had green screen, but we were literally on the Golden Gate Bridge going up and back. So uh, I think we just did it one time for that take. I think we did three takes, but on one trip. And then we were there for about half a day shooting that whole scene with, you know, ah, the giants. Spock, I noticed, a, what is a captain? I noticed a certain, you know, some more colorful metaphors. Well, it's all the, it's all the great literature at the time, the, narrow, the novels of Harold Robbins and the works of Jacqueline Suzanne. Uh -huh. The giants that that kills me every time. I don't know why that's that's all Nick Myers being a little snarky himself. So the movie had a lovely bit of snark about you know looking back at where we are. You know, judging by the pollution content in the atmosphere, Captain, I'd say we have arrived in the latter half of the 20th century. Um, <laughs> kind of poking fun at our culture and the planet Earth and humanity. Um, and so, you know, I think people really responded to that. And, and, and it was a perfect fit for me because I love humor in anything. I think one of my biggest beefs with a lot of science fiction is uh, things are too serious. Like people stuck on a spaceship for their life are not going to just sit around and be, yes, no, absolutely. I mean, like, in a military environment. And that's what I think uh, some of the Trek episodes like Shore Leave yeah. and, you know, the Bone Spock McCoy relationship. But then, um, uh, Next Generation really had more of that with literally, literally like couples, you know, people raising children. It was, and that's what I think people really related to. And Leonard knew that again as an actor and also just a very sensitive, warm person. He 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 got what, what worked about Star Trek on both levels. You know, the sci-fi concepts, obviously, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't, you know, wagon, it was... <laughs> Wagon Train to the Stars, I believe, is what Gene Roddenberry sold it as. And, and so he was focusing on the, the pioneers, not just which star or which planet they were going to. So, But for me, again, it was a good fit because it had that humor in it. I, I, I can't imagine work, working on, uh, you know, actually, I thought three was supposed to be funny because Christopher Lloyd was the head Klingon. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Like, okay. oh, and it's like, how do you not laugh? But it, and right. John Larquette. And John Lar I know. I, well, that's what I said. I was sitting there with John Laroquette, was his, or he was Krug, and Christopher Lloyd was... Uh, Crudge? Crudge? Something like that, right? Yeah, I don't remember. I'm sure somebody on the chat. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I'm just, I got... Um, yeah, just I, I guess you're seeing these too. Jason says, um, it warms my heart to know you came up with a voice and mask expert, Transparent Illumin. I'm one of my faves. Oh, thank you. And, my, and Mike Reese, he says, what a great life you live. Oh. Thank you, Mike. I'm very fortunate. I, I just hope it lasts a little longer and I get some more work. <laughs> I think the first 10 years of my career is like all these things. And then it's, I met Jim Henson. Well, that's a good segue. Yeah, a good segue. I met Jim and just basically worked solidly for that, for him and then his, his kids and the company until the year 2000. And then have been freelancing with them and a couple other, and Disney really, uh, since then. Now, when, when, when did you meet up with Jim? Um, About 80, it was the year that Star Trek came out. So I think that was 86 or 87. It all kind of melts together. I'm sure somebody, Lloyd was Krug. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Thank you, Jason. Malt, that was it. Thero Cat was Malt. Yeah. yeah. I knew you were a Star Trek fan, Jason. You didn't have to look that up, did you? Um, uh, because, yeah, well, so you, you met Jim in what, 87, you said? And I mean, you. Yeah, because a uh, uh, effects producer at a company called Omnibus Able, a gal named BJ Rack, was married to Bill Frawley, or sorry, Jim Frawley, who was the um, director of the first Muppet movie. Muppet movie. And uh, she had uh, kids with him. They were separated or divorced at this point, but she knew Jim because of that. Mm. And so she and I were talking because they were, they were pitching to do uh, effects on Trek for. And they didn't get it. Yeah, I became friends, and and I was telling her about uh, a project I was developing. In fact, I have one of the maquettes here that had creatures, and again, it was sci-fi and comedy. I'll give you the full screen. Hold on one second. Oh, that's okay. There, there you go. Oh, there's there's dinosaurs. Wait, back there. I'm all flipped around. So this is a project that I pitched to Jim that had these uh, genetically altered cockroaches and a bunch of weird creatures and aliens in it. And um, so she said, you should meet Jim Henson, and, and he's a guy who would love this. So I did. I met Jim and 
pitched that and we talked about a bunch of stuff and and he said i'd like to hire you and uh, i started working with him in la and then a year maybe nine months later i moved to new york mm -hmm. in early 88 to do the jim henson hour okay and oh, uh, i didn't realize they did that in new york well no it was shot in toronto canada okay but it was brainstormed and sort of created you know Gotcha. Pre-production was New York. We okay. shot it all, and, and I was in. I lived in Toronto, Canada, about as long as I lived in New York. It was about seven months in both locations. Gotcha. Um, and uh, I was an idea guy, I did drawings and ideas. That Jim was one of the few people that would um, uh, hire you to do that. You know, I wasn't a writer. I wasn't a creature builder, mm -hmm. uh, or puppet maker. I just was an idea guy, like a brainstorming partner. And in fact, that's what was great about working with Jim is that he hired people just to be his creative, you know, tennis player, you know, to just throw ideas around. So I did that with him on that show and then uh, moved back to LA because he didn't have a project. And I, he was generous enough to say, you know, you could just stay here and we'll just brainstorm and stuff together. And New York was expensive and I, I felt a little displaced from all my friends and also the mm -hmm. film business, which I still wanted to work in. Yeah. Came back to LA. I worked on Robocop 2, um, but obviously kept in touch with Jim. Got a job at Disney Imagineering design redes or on a redesign of Tomorrowland, specifically working on Aliens for the um, Carousel of Progress, was going to be a crashed alien ship. And so I and I brought Tony McVeigh down from Lucasfilm, who was mo probably most famous for uh, designing and building uh, Salacious Crumb. Mm -hmm. And so he and I designed Aliens for like seven months. And while I was doing that, I was also flying back to New York to work with Jim on Dinosaurs. Gotcha. Just as a freelancer. And Jim passed away, whatever it was, in May of that year, 1990, mm -hmm. and which was awful. So I'd worked with him about four and a half, five years. Yeah. Uh, and, we, I mean, we'd become very good friends. Again, Like he and Leonard felt like, like I said, my favorite uncles. You know, they just were very, very supportive and gave me a ton of respect in terms of listening to my ideas and spitballing or letting me just, yeah, you, you know, I like what you're doing. You do that. Um, which was a great education in, in working with creative people as someone now who hires and works with creative people is like, it seems like a no brainer, hire people whose work you like and let them have fun with it. You know, nobody likes to be told, Oh, draw another eye there. Now make it three shades darker of green. Mm -hmm. and, and both of those guys were not that way. They're like, Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Run with it. You know, uh, <clears throat> so we, uh, were working on dinosaurs. We'd had our second meeting. I had lunch with him, went over some sketches. I'd done my first round of sketches. We were talking about the characters and what the show would be. And, uh, so we hung out for like an hour, hour and a half, and it was just very friendly and it was sort of like having like lunch with your favorite uncle and sketching yeah. and talking about a fun idea. And then I stayed in New York that weekend cause I was back in LA, but I was, I said, well, if I'm going to, they're going to fly me out to New York, I'll pay for a hotel room for another couple nights and see friends and have fun in New York. So yeah. I did that. I flew home on Monday and I think he died Tuesday, mm -hmm. which was crazy. Cause I literally just seen him three, four days earlier mm -hmm. and I couldn't, I thought he'd been in a car accident when I got the phone call. I, nobody, how could you be have lunch with me and die from a disease that quickly? Yeah. Um, anyway, so that was awful. But then dinosaurs, uh, we pitched it to ABC and I just, I was on this big dinosaurs call with everybody and I was picking up things. I didn't know. Dean, Dean Valentine was the big, who was a development exec at Disney. I mean, at ABC, he really liked it and he, he was the champion for it. Um, but Michael Jacobs and Bob Young came in and we pitched it with a bunch of drawings I did, which you can see on the DVD. If you own the DVD of dinosaurs and the uh, additional footage behind the scenes, there's, me holding up, I think at least three or four, if not, they don't show all of the drawings that I did to sell the idea. Mm -hmm. And then we had to make it. <laughs> so we, I was in London for about two months supervising the sculpt and the build, and then everything moved to LA. And I was on the show for three years. It was four seasons, three years for me. And uh, I, I designed new characters if we needed them. Pete Brook and I kind of shared the design. Once the show was up and running, Pete designed uh, Roy past the T-Rex. And then between the two of us, we would design any new characters, mm -hmm. like, you know, the Graptolites and all these sort of secondary creatures if they had to be built. Now, um, I, I, had a, I had a question about dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Jason, Jason's just saying he, he grew up watching it. Um, 
I mean, I remember when dinosaurs came on, like th there were two big things in the press they were talking about. And what did you guys do to either live up to this or to not live up to it? Obviously, the first thing was this was Jim Henson's last project no. was dinosaurs. So, that, so I mean, there, there's a, a big responsibility with that because his name was definitely tied to it. Um, but then also making it something different that's not Muppety. And then the second thing is, is here we are at another sitcom. How are we doing this this show outside of our main characters being dinosaurs that we're not doing the Flintstones again? Right. Like, well, that was early. I remember in the variety, I think the criticism was like, yeah, I think the title of the review on the pilot episode was Yabba Dabba Duh. And it says, no, it's just taking the tired old, tired old formula of the Flintstones and making him dinosaurs instead of cavemen, which I thought was unfair, but whatever. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the pressure was just to make a good show like any show. It wasn't like we felt, you know, more pressure. I mean, I don't know how much how do you rate pressure, mm -hmm. uh, but we wanted to be good. We knew we were spending a lot of money. I mean, all those creatures, that was the most expensive show on television at that time. Um because every you know there was for every character on camera there was at least four people getting paid full salary to make them live the, the suit performer the face performer the vocal artist and then the people you know probably in a team of three people each keeping the performer alive and the suit repaired and you know painting the new skins and so yeah it was more like six people for each character so a huge crew big budget um but Jim, I mean, Jim never wanted to just do Muppets for the rest of his life. In fact, he, uh, that's why he hired me. He wanted to do computer stuff, and, and he liked the fact that I, I worked at Pixar and knew computer animation a bit. And, and I cre we created the character Waldo C. Graphic, which was the first computer live puppeteered puppet. Yeah. Um, and so he loved this idea of dinosaurs, and he was, he was in love with the technology that the creature shop had been... Um, advancing which was uh shown in ninja turtles and the storytellers yeah and these life-size sometimes larger than life realistic creatures i mean growing out of dark crystal labyrinth and then ninja turtle movies and uh the storyteller so he loved the idea of making actual walking talking dinosaurs that didn't look you know weren't felt in foam and feathers but late you know skin that looked like and so he liked, he and I both, again, that cockroach creature I showed you, I have other ones, but they're not right here. That sort of stylized reality. It's, it's, it's real scales and, you know, shiny eyes and wet mouths, but with the caricature caricature or a caricature. So uh, it was great to work on that. And, and what, what was really nice for me, just personally, Michael Jacobs and Bob Young, the showrunners, when it was starting and I was brainstorming with them, Michael said, you should write, you, you know, you've got funny ideas. You're, you're a good have you written? I said, well, yeah, I've written stuff, but I never got paid for it. He goes, well, I'm going to make you a, you know, producer on it and uh, your co-producer, whatever I was, one of the producers. But I wrote like four or five scripts and co-wrote or co-wrote like three and wrote two on my own. Mm -hmm. In fact, I wrote the last episode was based on an idea I had. Well, I, you know. I mean, I, I, I mean, we kind of jumped because I was going to say like the one thing about dinosaurs, too. Um, was of course it was this comedy with dinosaurs, but I mean there were a lot of social issues. Well, yeah, <laughs> like 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 there are some deep episodes. You mentioned here, you know, perfect right right into that, like that that final episode. Like, how did you come up? Like, well, that well, was everybody they die at the end. But yeah, like, Jim's yeah. concept was <laughs> let's do a show about dinosaur thinking with actual dinosaurs. Dinosaur thinking being, hey, we can do whatever we want. We're the we're the apex predator on the planet. So if we want to pave everything over with asphalt and make it a shopping center, then good for us. And if you don't like it, screw you. We're, we're the biggest, baddest, you know, SOBs in the Valley is that old quote went. And it was to show through comedy that maybe that's not the best way to approach your planet in your life. Yeah. And so it was baked into the premise. So the social issue things came a lot of, you know, came from the other writers who were, I wasn't, I was kind of a centrist back then. I've become more liberal mm -hmm. lately, but, uh, you know, but even just ideas like drugs being bad. Why are drugs bad? If it makes you feel good, why is it a bad thing? And 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 sometimes people didn't get it. Like they, I remember Hurling Day when you get to throw your mother-in-law off a cliff. Uh, the Great Panthers were up in arms about it because they didn't see it. They just read the TV god blurb where you know Earl the Earl is excited about throwing his mother off off a cliff because she turned sixty-five or whatever. But the whole premise was it's a bad idea and and showing through humor and sort of like, what was it? Uh, you know, eat the, de or eat the, eat the poor by um, 
Jonathan Swift, you know, like set up a ridiculous premise to show what a bad idea it is. Yeah. Um, but I remember the John Birch Society said we were the most seditious show on television. <laughs> and wow. and what was great was, and very much like Henson things in general, it worked on two levels. It worked as funny comedy with dinosaurs and the kind of Flintstone level gags of like the food in the refrigerator is actually alive. And it when it revolts, the food goes bad. You know, that was one of the episodes. Well, I think the first yeah. episode I, I co-wrote with Tim Doyle and um, all the way through to the end, which my joke was, well, I got to create them or help bring them to life i get to kill them but it, it didn't start as the final episode it started as just an, an episode about extinction about the bunch beetles coming in and ready to party because every year like you know 17 year locusts or something these insects arrive and breed like crazy then die off and then it's the next generation is created and well they paved over their uh, breeding grounds to be a wax fruit factory mm -hmm. uh, and so they, the original story was they just were kind of housed by the, the family and uh, these two kind of Shriner drunk beetles slowly got depressed and Robbie's like, well, we'll find you dates. You know, there must be two females out there. And it ended more on a hopeful note. Well, we got the notice from the network that they were canceling the series. Gotcha. So we said, well, let's, you know, <laughs> I think I forgot. It might've been Tim Doyle because he was great with these ideas. Like, let's have it be that they screw this up. Oh, I know what it was. It was that the plants, so these beetles would come and party, but then we'd eat these like kudzu kind of plant that would, so they weren't there to eat it. So this kudzu plant starts taking over. That was in my original story. And they were trying to figure out how to do it. And then Earl kind of screwed up fixing that. It was like, it was really about invasive species. And if you destroy one thing, then another thing becomes a problem. Oh, yeah. And then we just said, let's make it go all the way to them destroying the planet with a nuclear winter kind of thing. Um, it, it, it is though, we didn't see them die. Everyone's like, you killed them off. He said, no, it's just snowing out. <laughs> and they're not dead. And, but he does say we've been around for millions of years. I mean, what could, you know, I, 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 um, he's like, good night. Goodbye. You know, oh, yeah, not me, yes. <laughs> well, we want, I mean, you know, and people, I mean, it's great. People are thirties and their thirties now come up to me. He's like, oh my God, that's so traumatizing me as a kid. I said, but did you remember the message? Yeah. yeah. Don't destroy your planet. <laughs> uh, you know, which is, I, mean, I don't know how anyone's against that, you know, no one can say, well, that's a bad message. Um, but yeah, that was a great experience. And then because I'd been writing on that, I, I started writing for the Muppets and then uh, was very much behind Muppet Treasure Island and, and uh, getting that made and, and pushing that idea uh, when they were looking for ideas. Yeah, I mean, and then like, I mean, af after Dinosaurs, like, yeah, you have done so much. With the Muppets. Yeah, mainly with the Muppets or the Henson Company. I, I co-wrote Muppet Treasure Island. I directed a bunch of Muppet shorts, uh, co-produced or supervising producer on Muppets Tonight, uh, and then started directing. Uh, I did co-second uh, unit on Muppets from Space, and then I've done three three Muppet TV specials or TV movies. Um, uh, uh, Very Merry Muppet Christmas, Muppets Wizard of Oz, Muppets Letters to Santa. So two of them are Christmas movies. One's The Wizard of Oz. And then a project with the Henson Company that Jim had originally uh, pitched, like in the late, late 1968, called Turkey Hollow, mm -hmm. which I was originally going to write and direct, but that we were going to shoot in Canada and you can't do both and get Canadian uh, tax breaks. So I, I relinquished writing and uh, just and just directed it. I mean, I, sh I created the story from what Jim and Jerry Jewell had written and kind of updated a little bit and took it away from being cutesy. And that, that was on sci-fi, correct? That was a sci that was a sci-fi. No, it was on a Lifetime. Lifetime, yeah. Because I, 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 I remember it airing, I just forgot. Because sci-fi, you had um, the show with Gigi. The, uh, yes, that was uh, the Jim Henson uh, Creature Top Challenge. And then the most recent thing I did that people could see is uh, The Curious Creations of Christine McConnell on Netflix, where they, they had a deal with Christine, but they needed a showrunner to create a show with and for her and they brought me in because it was right in my alley it was creatures and comedy and creating stuff which you know i'd done uh and christine and i hit it off she's a lovely person but you know had always kind of done her own thing like mainly photographs mm -hmm. and so you know kind of took her through the process of making a show and and i wrote four of the episodes uh and then my friend jordana wrote uh two and i directed all of them but it was a very fast schedule but it was a great I love that show and I love the characters. That's something I wish I wish would have come back for another season because we had a lot of 
ideas. But if you're fans of anyone's fans of it, Christine McConnell has her own uh, YouTube channel and her own Patreon. Mm -hmm. You can watch her make amazing stuff, um, you know, every month, um, which is was great. And then now I'm well waiting to do stuff with the uh, Muppets. I had a couple projects. I had a project with Jeff Bezos that was going to happen. That oh, wow. I mean, the COVID's really shut down. I was going to have this banner year with a Muppet project and a Jeff Bezos thing and possibly another show, an animated series that I, I wrote a Bible for, for uh, a fellow creator, but he wasn't a writer and everything just stopped. So, yeah, no, I mean, it's certainly interesting times, but I mean, it, as I think one of the things, and this is why I've been saying with everybody that's been on the show is I, and it's, working with the Muppets especially, I think when we are done, hopefully at some point with this whole coronavirus COVID thing, like, I mean, this COVID sucks, Jason wrote. Yeah, I, I really think that the world is going to need like Kermit the Frog and his friends. They need them now, but I mean, we want to- Yeah, I, I kind of liken where we are to um, either right after the stock market crash in the thirties, when, you know, comedies, uh, Laurel and Hardy and Abbott Costello, all that was, big or after the Vietnam War in the 70s when Monty Python and just and the Muppets, you know, that kind of uh, the nation and the planet in this case is hurting. And I think joy and fun and, and sort of a, a good name and absurdity, like just the absurdity of life, uh, having fun with that because um, everything's so dire. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that <laughs> there'll be more work than we can handle as opposed to what it is right now is there's, you know, little to no work. And I mean, certainly uh, you and I were talking about this earlier um, before we came on, but you have Muppets now you worked on that as well. Yeah. I directed a half of those. Um, it was, so we created that. We shot that last year over a year ago and um, it's been re-edited. So I'm not exactly sure it was originally presented as like six different premises or shows sort of like if you have, you know, six different shows on Netflix but they're all Muppet based with different Muppet characters sort of heading their shows. And, um, and they were going to release them. I think each one episode of each every week. So it'd be six weeks and you'd get these 10 minute, you know, six to 10 minute episodes. And now I've been told they, they, they went through testing and all that and they've re-edited it and I'm not sure how it's going to be delivered, but it's fun. It's, it's more, it's not as scripted as like the Muppet show or anything. It's more kind of a, uh, Improvies. There's interviews with the celebrities. There's like uh, you know more of a game show, science show, cooking show kind of vibe to it. Like, oh, we've got this guest, and now we're going to do something as opposed to stories. It's it's not fictional stories. It's more like being in the moment, like you see on I don't know all these other networks that have quote unquote reality shows. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Quote reality. <laughs> There is no such thing as a reality show. <laughs> um, Especially with puppets, yeah. Ex exactly. I mean, do you think, and you've worked with, you've worked with the Muppets, again, in quite a few projects. And certainly, like you said, you wrote two, you wrote two um, holiday films with them, or holiday stuff. I directed them. I did not write them. I directed them. I'm sorry. That's um, all right. Um, and I mean, certainly, I think that the Christmas is when the Muppets thrive. Like, for some reason, yeah. that, that well, is the, it. You know, with the Hollywood Bowl shows, we didn't mention that. Those live shows, which were basically a callback to the original Muppet Show, it's a live event in a theater setting, a giant theater setting. But people really love that, and it was great to write because you don't, you're not servicing a huge plot, you know. Like the Muppets, the Muppet movies are hard, especially when it's the Muppets today, because suddenly it's it's about relationships and Kermit and Piggy, and I, I think they do better when they're. I mean, this is my personal belief. Other people disagree. But for me, like Treasure Island and um, The Caper, where it's it's a parody of a genre. It's a you know a pirate movie or a caper, you know, spy caper movie, or a Pink Panther kind of thing, as opposed to you know Kermit. Kermit is is bamboozled by you know an evil neighbor or something. Uh, <laughs> I just think you can't really do much with that because it gets so plot heavy. Whereas the Muppets, to me, are better having fun with a genre more like again monty python to me they've always been like python like i would love to do a muppet spy movie a muppet, i wrote a muppet space movie i've written two muppet halloween haunted house kind of movies um, I it does. Jeez. yeah I mean, a muppet sci-fi thing a muppet western jerry jewel and i were talking about collaborating on a western right before he passed away i would say a year maybe two after we'd done treasure island we we talked about he had this great idea and uh i just said wow that would be awesome because 
you kind of get the world and then the Muppets can, it's like Austin Powers too. You yeah. have fun with it. So half the fun is seeing how they look at that. And Mel Brooks, you know, comedy is very often um, making fun of an established aesthetic and a genre. And I think the Muppets do that really well, sometimes more than just what their personal problems are. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll just throw out to you one idea I thought would be really great too. And this is what comes after like Treasure Island, like some of those other things, Muppets and Camelot. Like a, like a, well, it's funny you yeah. say that. That was King Muppet King Arthur was the other idea we were playing with when we chose uh, um, uh, Treasure Island. And the reason we didn't do Camelot, because I like that idea too, was it was really about the um, uh, treachery of Lancelot to Arthur cheating oh. with Peter So uh, even with the Muppets, you know, I mean, you could do it like Roger Rabbit, you know, playing patty cake, but it kind of took the, you know, with pirates, there's act. You can have sword fights and death, in, inferred death is there. Billy Bones dies. Where Camelot, it, they just kind of sit around and it's this big romance. Um, so we would probably have to just make it a King Arthur world, not the Guinevere Lancelot uh, love triangle. I mean, we probably would have because we talked about it. it was going to Lancelot was going to be a handsome actor. You know, at that time would have been a, you know, a Mel Gibson or whoever we could get. And Piggy was always flirting with him, but they weren't going off and having an affair. And then, you know, there would be dragons and more kind of medieval yeah. tropes to have fun with. But yeah, I, I love that. I love that world. I think. Bunsen and Beaker is like your Merlin, the magician kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We have a dragon. We get to build a big Muppet dragon or whatever. Yeah. I, I, you know, all those genres lend themselves to. Oh my God. Our, our idea for the Muppet Western was Kermit was a sheriff, becomes sheriff, but he won't use a gun. Yeah. So because he's Kermit, right? So all these bad guys have guns, and he he kind of you know I think there's actually a movie, Destry Rides Again. Um, oh, a bunch of people are joining us now. Uh, everybody, wow, everybody's coming in here now. Hey, Phil. Yeah, Miss Piggy is a fart. Um, my, uh, my son heard you say Kermit carrying a gun. He said he said guns are not appropriate. So no, Kermit should not exactly. be exactly. Kermit. Kermit would not use a gun. That's exactly right. <laughs> Kermit, Kermit fights for good. Well, he wouldn't fight. That was the whole point. Um, so that's where, you know, the personalities really lend themselves to the characters, but they're not the Muppets living in a house today. I, I just don't, for me personally, I don't know what to do with that um, without bringing in some, you know, like what they've done. Oh, yeah. there's an imposter who, who, you know, looks like Kermit and, and leads the Muppets astray. Or, you know, Tex, what's his name, wants to take the theater over, which is funny because that was essentially the plot of I, I know watching and i mean I've, I've seen all of them several times i own them all and it's like it's 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 the same story essentially the muppet theater and then how did it get closed between both but you know there is no continuity in the world of the muppets yeah exactly um the one thing though as you're sitting there talking about the relationship between kermit and piggy i yeah. mean again like that's it's and that's such an easy aside from Kermit getting bamboozled. You know that's such an easy trope. Like you know, go into oh, okay, Kermit and Piggy are having a relationship problems again. Like there are so many rich characters, and I know people have their opinions about Muppets from Space, but I can definitely see that they did try something new. Like yes, Kermit and Piggy are there, but we're right. focusing on Gonzo, and there are so many great characters. Like I mean, imagine doing like a um, like a BH1 behind the music of the Electric Mayhem and just make that. Yeah. A spinal tap. Well, it. yeah. I mean, the Electric Mayhem, they're their own thing. Uh, Muppet Monsters, which I've always loved. One of the reasons I loved the Muppets as a kid was the Sesame Street Monsters. I'm like, let's do something with the monsters that were too scary for Sesame Street. Like like Uncle Deadly, but a whole, you know, uh, and the characters from SNL, uh, the, the Land of Scorch. You yeah. know, you can grow the brand, and I, I've been a big proponent of that. But, you know, I think when you go to marketing people, they're like, well, people don't want new characters. They want Kermit and Piggy. So sometimes the 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 fans aren't always right. <laughs> well, I mean, Deadly has a new life. I mean, what Matt Vogel is doing with Deadly now is phenomenal. He's yes, great. and and I look. I tried to create a series for Deadly back in the '90s. I love Deadly. I've always loved Deadly, and I'm just so happy that they they gave him a character, and Matt's done an amazing job with him. I mean, if I had my druthers, I'd Uncle Deadly have his own Elvira kind of show or something. I don't know with creatures. Yeah. Wow. But yeah, I love I love the Muppets as a comedy troupe. Um, and I think the soap opera about their lives behind the camera it only takes you so far. I mean, that's why Crip Muppet Christmas Carol is a huge movie. It's they're playing these characters, mm -hmm. but they bring, you know, they bring their personalities to them 
and uh, and and fill kind of an old standard with with new energy. Um, again, like um, you know, Fozzie Bear is the idiot son in uh, Muppet Treasure Island. And, the man in his finger. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, again, that's very me. I Frank Oz was a little concerned about it when he read the script. He's like, so he's crazy. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> But he's like, but Frank, being a good performer, is like, why is he crazy? I said, because he's a rich kid. He's never had to work a day in his life. So his imaginary friend, because why not? Like, he doesn't have to deal with it. The whole point is he doesn't deal with reality because he's been mollycoddled by money. Okay. And now suddenly he's thrust into the real world with pirates and everything. And he's still, you know, my favorite bit with that is like, Mr. He closes his eyes and Mr. Bimbo's fencing. He's like, Mr. Yeah. Bimbo. <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, that was just, that's classic me being weird and goofy which is why i love the muppets you know because you can do that with them well i mean was that one line also at the end there with rizzo um where it's like if you hurt gonzo and jim we'll uh what was it negotiate regulate negotiate rigorously or something like that rizzo says something like i forget what the word was oh exactly. right uh, that, was, that was great to write it's great to work with jerry jewel look okay, i'm just saying people are like I'm just saying, Steve said he used to live for seven. He was a kid on The Muppet Show. Um, Aiden, Aiden Alden says, House on Muppet Hill, Uncle Deadly as a Vincent Price character. Hey. Yeah, exactly, Alden. That kind of thing, I think, would be great. We couldn't actually do that because that's copywritten, but that kind of story. In fact, I, we've Jim Lewis and I, I think, have written five versions of Halloween, Haunted House, Ghostbusters, Muppet uh, ideas, and they just never, they get, we get paid to write it and then they never get made, and I don't know why. So Disney's really sitting on a whole bunch of... Well, I, I heard when Disney bought them, I'm like, hey, guys, so they're like, you know, what should we do with the Muppets? Like, we've got this backlog of scripts, but because the Henson Company paid for them, Disney would have to buy them from them. There's some political gotcha. or financial reason why they can't do that. Because prior to the Jason Siegel, the Jason Siegel movie, weren't they supposed to do that Jerry Jewell script, the cheapest Muppet movie ever made? I remember that was we talked yeah. about for about 10 years. Yeah. And uh, it was when Jerry was alive, it was had some heat. And then they decided to do his uh, script. His, uh, Muppets from Space was originally called Star Gonzos. Mm -hmm. Star Gonzo. And then I'd written a script called Muppets, uh, Muppets in Space. And it was, it was a sci fi Star Wars, Star Trek parody. Mm -hmm. And so they liked Jerry's script. It was Sony. Disney was going to do my movie or my script. And then the Sony deal happened and they bought the rights to the Muppets. And then they decided to do Jerry's because it was a smaller, more intimate film. But then it got rewritten to the point where it was the only thing that was left from Jerry's script was uh, Gonzo thought he was an alien and a bunch of people were following him. But everything else was, was it. there were 17 writers who worked on that script, my, oh, my, myself included in Punch Up. So it was kind of, it wasn't a great working process. Um, I know a lot of people love it. And there's a lot of fun stuff in it, uh, but to me, it was kind of a messy, a meandering movie. It's not a bad movie, but it just. And look, you know, I love a Casino Royale, which is a, a, the, the original uh, comedy version, not the yeah. Daniel Craig one. And that's a big mess, but I still like it because it's funny, and it, I'm not expecting it to, you know, be this big spy movie. I expect it to be funny. So yeah. I think it's the same thing with Muppets from Space. It's just goofy and messy and fun. Um, which I, I think the Muppets can get away with. Yeah, well, that's the thing. If you go to see a Muppet movie, you're not looking for like some kind of artistic... Yeah, like I said, it's Monty Python's Life of Brian. It's it's Mike Myers movies. You know, you just want to have fun and 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 see the creativity in both the concepts and the characters. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, think, I think one of the issues with Disney and the Muppets is they don't have... Um, 800 pound gorilla saying, you know, I mean, Jason Siegel got a movie made and he's Jason Siegel. I'm not saying he's bad, but he was a TV star. Oh, well, Jason Siegel knows what, knows what to do with the Muppets because he was a big Muppet fan. And then it was, uh, you know, uh, and then James Bobin did his movie and it's sort of, and then Josh Gad was going to do his thing. So there isn't like a Jim Henson or a Brian Henson or someone that they trust to be the point person for, um, the Muppets that they'll go, oh, okay, you know, there's no John Lasseter from the Muppets. There's no Pete Doctor. There's there's um, no uh, Kevin Feige. Um, yeah. And I think, so it ends up being a lot of stuff by committee or by, you know, group decision, which isn't always bad. The people who now are in charge of the Muppets are great. They uh, One's from Australia and one's from England. And they love that Muppet humor that I love. Um, and so I feel like they're in good hands, but we really haven't, nobody's seen anything yet. They haven't had a chance to uh, make anything 
Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's whatever the politics of Disney and and now with the, the COVID, it just kind of put a kibosh on everything. But yeah. I know they have great ideas that we were talking about. So the Muppets are not dead. It's just been a rough couple of years. Yeah, that's the thing. They, they, they come in spurts. They're, they're, they're around a lot and then they disappear somewhat and they do like their little, little cameo appearances. Kermit sings his Rainbow Connection and then you know, they come back. Well, again. The Muppets are the underdogs both in the movies and in real life. You know, I mean, and that's part of it. Look, financially, Marvel, you, you release, you know, uh, Mandalorian juggles, you know, three balls and sings Merry Christmas. A billion people watch it. You yeah. can spend a hundred million dollars on a Muppet movie, and you'll you know you make two hundred thousand back. It's yeah. It's just we don't have that huge audience, so it's hard to compete with Star Wars and and Marvel. Yeah. You know? But part of that is Star Wars and Marvel are growing. You know, they're not just doing Avengers movies now. They're not just doing Iron Man and the Hulk. And I think this again, this is my personal opinion. And uh, we need to do grow them up and brand do things that aren't just. Are Kermit and Piggy dating? Are they married? Are they going to have a baby? Are you know is he dating? Uh, and and then again, a Muppets now is a start. You know, yeah, it, it's playing with. Okay, what if we gave just these two guys a show, or this guy a show, and what would his show be um, if if he had a reality show? So it, it's playing with it a little bit. It, it um, I think they're just testing the waters, and I think and also Disney Plus is figuring out what it is. Yeah, you know, what, is their, what is their audience? Is it all kids? Is it kids and family? Is all the adult stuff go to Hulu? Uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of turnover and and uh, in the business right now, particularly at, at Disney and Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, because now we're we're a little bit over our time. Um, I guess last question, I'll just I'll just throw out to you as we're sitting here talking about the Muppets, you know, and a nice place to like end with. Um, and you knew Jim. Um, yeah, very well. Where where do you think where if had Jim still been around today? Um, where where do you think? The like outside of Disney, because I know the Disney deal was happening at that point in time. Do you think he would have been more in interested with at least with Kermit and his crew um, of doing those like offshoot storylines, or would he? Have well, yeah, Jim. Think? Jim loved make. He, Jim was a creator. That's when people say, "Are you a you know, are you writer director?" I said, "Well, it sounds snarky, but I'm a creator because I'm following the footsteps of Jim Henson, who." Liked everything. He loved the Muppets, but he also loved Dark Crystal, and he loved yeah. Labyrinth, and he loved doing it for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So, and if I, I, could, if I could just, if I could just say honestly, like you, I mean, you, everybody's heard the stories. If you're a Muppet fan, you you read about, you know, what happened with Dark Crystal and what happened with Labyrinth. Like my God, if he was alive today to see like Dark Crystal, I mean Labyrinth as well, but like Dark Crystal, especially the life that Dark Crystal has now yeah. taken. My God, he would. No, and he, that's what he wanted to do, keep making stuff. In fact, the reason he was selling to Disney, and you know, he, he and I had a conversation about it, and he, and, be, and he said in the press, Disney knows how to keep characters alive. They they respect the characters. They they don't just sell them down the river to be selling, you know, toast and jam. And so he could focus on making new stuff. He he, he didn't want the mantle of always doing Muppet stuff, like even though that was like the goose. It's like Disney just didn't do Mickey Mouse cartoons, no matter yeah. Mickey Mouse was the um you know spongebob of his day but disney said well let's do something else because again creative individuals don't like to get pigeonholed mm -hmm. and disney had some hits and some huge misses and jim had his misses uh you know dark crystal and labyrinth were not successful in their first run uh um dinosaurs was and he passed away you know but yeah. uh sadly so i think he would be doing i think disney would be doing Muppet stuff and Jim would be a creative consultant <laughs> and, and, you know, we're doing in theme park rides and probably playing with VR, you know, uh, going to a world where you can be in the dark crystal world. I mean, he loved technology. He, mm -hmm. that's why, again, he hired me to do Waldo. He loved this new technology that you could do so much with. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know, he, he, there, people like him are few and far between, particularly who rise to the level of running their own, company very often now it's lawyers and 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 marketing people you know it's a bit of the tail i mean again i'm a creative person so this is my perspective yeah i, I feel like it's the tail wagging the dog it's like well what can we sell <laughs> well you can only sell it no one's gonna say i want here's this original idea i have they're gonna say i like star wars i like the muppet movie make another muppet movie but that's the muppet movie when it was made was the first muppet movie that's why it's a big hit exactly. so, but it, it's hard for uh, financial people and marketing people to trust 
you know, you've got to earn that trust. Like John Favreau definitely has it now. Kevin Feige has it. Um, uh, they've earned the trust as like, oh, these guys, whatever that mojo is, whether, you know, hiring actors and hiring writers, they know how to make something that people like and they're growing the brand. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned, like, I'm thinking of other people, um, the guy who did Thor Ragnarok, what's it, Hey Say Too? Oh, Take Away TV. Amazing. Yeah, like, Lovely, yeah. the nicest guy in the world and so creative. And, and But that's Kevin Feige saying, I'm going to trust this guy who's basically made small independent movies for a million bucks or something in New Zealand. You know, he did Hunt for the Wilder People. He did What We Do in the Shadows um, and say, I'm going to give him a $150 million movie on this huge franchise that it had basically two mediocre uh, movies and he blew it out of the park. And I think he was, and I think Feige and, and Marvel and Disney realized that what James Gunn had done with uh, Guardians of the Galaxy was a good direction. Let's have a little more fun with it, not take everything so seriously. Yeah. Um, not that there's no room for that, but you know, Iron Man had a sense, the, the Hulk movies were kind of humorless. Iron Man, Favreau brought a sense of, and humor sometimes is just the humanity of the absurdity of a comic book situation, you know? Here's this snarky rich guy who suddenly is in a cave and he's working with a scientist to build this, you know, and he's got a heart condition. And and it's funny, and Robert Downey like brought the snarky personality that made it seem like a real person, not just a comic book character. And I think um, the more outrageous, the more humor you need. I think Jim Cameron movies tend to lack humor. And that my biggest problem with Avatar, when I loved it, was nobody ever said, I um, mean, the, the best line in Aliens was Bill Paxton going, I don't know if you guys know game over, man. We just got our asses kicked. You're like, yes, that's what I would say. Not let's lock and load and fight those bastards till they're, you know, their last one's breathing. People panic and act human. I think that humanity is weirdly what makes the Muppets and dinosaurs and then most things I've worked on, Star Trek and even Star Trek. Like, perfect, perfect, like goes right back to Star Trek, like Star Trek Four. The humanity, the joy in that yeah. film. So I mean Full circle, yeah, absolutely. So, no, Kirk, thank you. I know we went over tonight, but thank you so much for for oh. this all tonight. And thanks everybody. I mean, I, I'm looking at the comments, everybody's been uh, enjoying this tonight. So, thanks for everybody for tuning right. in. And the story. Aloha. So, yes. Um, so, join us. Um, we'll be back on Thursday night. Um, I think we're just going to have a fan chat. So, tune in for our next and credit chat then, and we'll be back mm -hmm. next Monday as well. So, again, Kirk, thank you so much, and thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. Stay safe. Wear a mask. Yes.